Uh, before we start the debate, I've just got two announcements to make. Um, one is your badges. We're going to recycle the badge holders, being a, an organization devoted to economy. So could you please remember to deliver your badge holders back before you go? I mean, it really does actually save quite a lot of money for future events. That's, that's the most boring part. The other is there are still, a f if anybody wants to go on the tour, the guided tours of uh, Majesty Museum with Stephen Welsh, who's the creator of, of Living Cultures, there are still some, some spaces on the tours for the afternoon, which is well worth doing this. Because Manchester does have a very good uh, ethnic, ethnographic collection, and Stephen is a very interesting guy, so you'll, you'll have quite a nice time if, you, if you've got the time and don't have to go to another panel. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to Simone Abraham, who's going to chair this debate and sit back and enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and uh, fellow members of the IUAES, as we now all are, welcome to this third debate uh, in this 17th World Congress. Okay. Um, I, uh, my name is Simone Abram, and I was born and brought up here in Manchester, as was my mother, although she went to school in Australia during the war. Uh, her father was brought to Manchester as a baby uh, from the Polish-Czech border. Um, my own father was, uh, came to Manchester from South Africa, where his parents fled from uh, Lithuania at the turn of the last century. Uh, and he had an uncle who made it to New York and an aunt who made it to Washington and uh, some m other uncles who sadly didn't make it out and were deported to Siberia. So I like to think that when it comes to the free movement of peoples around the world, our families made an effort to make it into a reality. The motion today is that the free movement of people around the world would be utopian. And we have four very distinguished speakers to help us with the debate. For the, for the motion, Bella Feldman Bianco teaches in the graduate program of social anthropology at the State University of Campinas in Brazil and was last year the president of the Brazilian Association of Anthropology. She's published widely on migration and diaspora, particularly between Brazil and Portugal, and her book on photography, iconography, and video is in its fifth edition. She's also known for her 1991 documentary, uh, documentary film, Saudade, on Port Portuguese immigrants to the USA. Noel Salazar is research professor in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Leuven and is currently president of the European Association of Social Anthropologists. His research encompasses tourism and mobility, and his monograph, Envisioning Eden, Mobilizing Imaginaries in Tourism and Beyond, was published in 2010. Against the motion, Sharon Koshravi is Associate Professor in the Department of Social Anthropology at Stockholm University. His research on Iranian migrants to Sweden includes questions of gender, masculinity and identity, entrepreneurship, and the legalities of migration, and he's published on youth and defiance in Iran. He also publishes fiction with short stories published in Collective Exile, a literary magazine, and in Exiled Inc. magazine. His book, Illegal Traveller, an autoethnography of borders, was published in 2010. Nicholas de Genova is currently reading in the Department of Anthropology at Goldsmiths, University of London, but in this autumn, he's going to move to be a reader in urban geography at the Department of Geography at King's College, London. His work on transnational Mexican migrant factory workers in Chicago in the 1990s was published in Working the Boundaries, Race, Space, and Illegality in Mexican Chicago in 2005. And he's co-edited books on the politics of race, sovereignty, space, and freedom of movement. Before we start the debate, I'd like to remind you that the format of the debate is not, uh, does not have its intention the reaching of a consensus. So we're not trying to agree with each other today. Uh, we're going to have winners and losers in the vote at the end of the debate. But hopefully we'll all gain by uh, thrashing out the arguments and perhaps thinking a little differently at the end of the debate than before we start. So uh, with no further delay, I'd like to welcome Bella to uh, propose the motion, the free movement of people around the world would be utopian.
Good morning. I am honored to participate in this provocative and timely debate, not only because of the growing scholarship and interest on movement, mobility, and migration, but also politically, given the exacerbated prejudice and xenophobia against foreigners, particularly those undocumented and with darker skins, who have been asked to go home or face arrest. I think a couple of weeks ago in the suburbs of London. Even worse, foreigners have been mistakenly perceived as terrorists and murdered by the British police, as was the case of the notorious assassination of the Brazilian Jean Carlos in 205 that resulted in the mobilization in Brazil for the rights of Brazilian immigrants. As this short motion is intended to stimulate debate, I will situate my argument against the ongoing and apparent contradictory constructions of borderless and bordered worlds. As financial capital, science, and virtual communications seem to dissolve borders, the number of displaced people escalated, reaching around 300 million worldwide, according to a 211 UN report. The numbers are even higher if we add an estimated 740 million internal migrants, some of whom have suffered displacement as a result of large development projects and real estate interests. We don't know the numbers. Hence, issues related to the movement of people, in particular transnational migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, have become high priorities in the public agendas of both multilateral agencies like the UN, World Bank, and the OIM, and national governments. By placing the discussion, the motion under discussion against the current struggles, the image that comes to my mind is that of the border as a dramatic battlefield. On the one hand, the movements of people across borders have been subjected to discriminatory migration and mobility policies and programs. In addition to a greater selective control in the issuing of visas and passports, dual classifications and categories differentiating between the so-called legal or illegal immigrants have made way for a social construction of illegality entrenched in the current European and US draconian policies equating migration and crime. As part of the ongoing war against trafficking, illegal migration, and terrorism, multilateral agencies have been exporting worldwide conceptions linking migration to the trafficking of human beings, as well as the idea of migrants as agents of development to the provision of remittances. Underneath the seemingly contradictions are rational attempts to regulate the demand and supply of labor through migrants' temporary work, while denying them rights to residence and social benefits. And As a result of the growing surveillance of at borders, women, men, and children have been arrested, confined in detention camps, or deported, why risking their lives crossing borders, either to escape from violent conflicts in their homeless, or just to fulfill their dreams, hopes, and projects of a better life. Many died brutally murdered during these passages. On the other hand, the fight against borders, all type of borders, has become a metaphor for the current social movements in favor of the free circulation of people and thus for social justice. The expansion of this movement led to the creation of the Global Social Forum on Migration in 204 with its claims to universal citizens and a world without borders. The strong images exposing the enduring struggles suggest to me that according to the angle taken, we can agree or disagree 
that the free movement of people around the world would be viewed as utopian. In either case, we would not be wrong or right. But I agree that the free movement of people is, fund is fundamentally a matter of social justice and human rights. And I think that the ut utopian visions are intrinsic to the social movements while utopia embeds the dreams, hopes, and projects of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. Yet, for a better understanding of the current social processes, we should place the motion within a broader historical context. For why human mobility is millenary, the movement of people around the world has been ever since the 15th century part of capital formation and thus emerged with racialization, colonialism, capitalist expansion, imperialism, and corollary structures of domination of inequality. A 1982 song entitled Fruto do Suor, that I am translating as Sweeting Gains, sang by Raizes da America, a musical group formed by Brazilians, Chileans, and Argentinas who escaped their countries Arch dictatorships and settled in Sao Paulo in 1980 at a time of the Brazilian democratic reopening sums up these long processes that started six centuries ago with poetic license. I won't read it. I think that's better that you read. How can I put it through? Is it okay? You don't have my accent with that. Okay? Sure. It's a free translation, so we... Okay. Likewise today, likewise today social movements, these political activists who were attacking capitalism, imperialism fought for social justice, as well for the erasing of borders between natives and foreigners. As this song suggests, the immigrants portrayed in the poem, who came mostly from the old world, have become part of the social fabric of and contributed to the localities in which they settle, even if they have not been so welcome. But at the time, the musicians, at the same, at the time of the musicians of Raizes da America, were forced to seek exile in different parts of the world, their political displacements became interlinked with the contingents of former colonial subjects who began roaming to Europe and to the United States as a response to the crisis in their homelands generated by neoliberal policies, flexible capital, and labor. And after the 2018 to 99 economic, global economic crisis, there has been a new redirection of migration from the so-called global north to the global south. For a historical perspective, since we are here in Manchester, the symbolic gateway city of immigrants, once of a time at the vanguard of industrial capitalism, it is worth remembering that, first, the historical mass migration of Europeans to the new world also followed the turmoil of the global political economy and was faced with European at that time, European governmental policies attempting to close borders, borders to prevent immigration and also to separate families in order for the state to profit from the remittances sent back by migrants, as was the case of Portugal till the 1950s. Uh, national immigration policies have always selected who are the desirable and the non-desirable foreigners, like today. Three, in the 1920s, Europeans and other migrants to the U.S. confronted deportation, closed borders, 
and U.S. preference to, for temporary migration. Four, in the United States, United, Nations, United States, international migrants were considered second and third class citizens, both at home and at the, in the localities of settlement. In fact, uh, immigrants, immigrants were considered second and third class citizens. Five, the struggles between capital and labor of the past encompassed an international mobilization calling for workers of the world to unite for social justice and again the, against difficult labor conditions. Today, the juxtaposition of neoliberal policies, multicultural ideologies, and flexible capital and labor have led to the loss of the achievements of the labor mobilizations of the early 20th centuries. But again, we have increased exploitation, economic vulnerability, and the criminalization of migrants. And again, there are new forms of social mobilization against the status quo. Is this from this long uh, perspective that I, I propose that, uh, that uh, uh, the motion should be, that the, the free movement of people across the world is a mother of social justice and human rights as claimed by the current movements such as the report presented by the uh, South American sp uh, um, Space Without Borders coalition to the United States high dialogues on migration and development, when, where they stated, we understand that it's fundamental that nation states recognize migration as a right. We insist that all migrants should have access to similar labor, economic, social, cultural, and political rights. From this point, this viewpoint, I propose that the uh, utopian vision, vision is intrinsic not only to today's social movements favoring the free circulation of people around the world, but also is intrinsic to the social mobilizations organized around worker strikes or by the politics of identity in behalf of gender and race equality. There is a utopia vision that drives, compels the social movements. And I further advocate that it's equally crucial to understand the utopia embed in the desires, hopes, dreams, and projects of immigrants, refugees, and other displaced populations, both in the present and in the past. What is the meaning of the dreams, hopes, and projects in the everyday life of migrants, refugees, and other displaced individuals in, in specific localities? How do they manage? And by way of a visual ethnography I made, I don't know how long, I am very bad at this. At this <laughs> no, yes, I am now under control. Yes. <laughs> By, I have, okay. By way of a visual ethnography I made in the 1990s entitled Saudade or Nostalgia, I have portrayed how women and men whose immigration history encompasses the transition from pre industrial test oriented activities in Portugal, in rural Portugal to industrial work in rural Bet New Bedford, Massachusetts, have tended to develop a romantic nostalgia for the immediate past of non-industrial labor. And I am going to show uh, a very short abstract of Basilio, how his work in the factory sweatshop, making, it's like, Chap like Chaplin, and then how in, the, in his leisure time he he reconstructs our topic is always. In fact, it is a dialogue with E.P. Thompson. But, and now. And now. Brasilio Sosa is a 46-year-old farmer from the Azores. Brasilio became a factory worker after coming to New Bedford in the 1970s. Like Joe, he spends much of his time outside of work in the garden. Instead of bringing his family to the Azores, Basilio brought a piece of the Azores to America. His work at home is regulated by the seasons, the needs of the plants, and the harvest. Okay, so uh, 
about all these uh, symbolic representations and social practices of the, of the past of Basilio or other rural uh, immigrants of, uh, provide the basis for their self-reconstitution as people. They say it as Azores, Madeiras, but this is happening, like this has been happening in the past and still happens and but with rural uh, immigrants from rural, rural extraction. Uh, immigrants like Basilio and other Azorians uh, that are in New Bedford have built strong transnational social fields and networks and have dual citizenship and nationality rights due to the incorporation of the diaspora in the Portuguese nation. More recently, a period, in a period marked by the refraction of Portuguese immigra immigration and the closing of borders, undocumented migrants from Latin America and Central America have come to New Bedford, replacing the Portuguese as unskilled workers in the remaining industries of the locality. These new immigrants, some of them indigenous, uh, from Guatemala, have been exposed to home security rates both in 204 and 207. And particularly the second rate to, of the 207, uh, Homeland Security agents arrested 300 women and men, mostly from Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Mexico, that resulted in separation of a number of mothers from their small children and even their deportation. This is happening all around. I'm just using a case. How do people manage to live and transform their lives in such dramatic situations when they have been denied conditions of existence and why their labor is exploited? How can we understand the human condition without taking into account the subjectivities, the dreams, and the hopes, and the utopia that drive us and make us transform our lives for then leading us to social mobilization against the status quo? Thank you very much. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm against the motion because um, when we say this sentence, we mean that we have reached a point that the free mobility of humanity on the earth is unlikely. And I believe in a political vision in which free mobility can be possible. What I'm going to say is a political and poetic reflection over this motion. Utopia is an imaginary future. However, our ideas about the utopian future say something about the present time, which is far from an ideal society, dystopia. Dystopia is not opposite of utopia. Dystopia is a utopia which has gone wrong. Dystopia is a situation which utopian ideas are available and accessible only for a particular group of community. Free mobility exists already for commodities, for capital, and jobs, but not for migrants. It exists also for a small number of humanity. Well, a small category of people enjoy unrestricted mobility rights most people are caught between borders. The regulation of mobility operates through social sorting that involves sexual, gender, racial, and class inequalities. Utopia is about an imagined future. It is well organized and just. Dystopia is the present situation for a large number of people for 45 million forced displaced, categorized, and labeled as refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced people, and stateless people. The present dystopia is a dark and terrifying predicament for travelers without papers, so-called illegal migrant, illegalized human beings. The dystopia many are suffering from is the contemporary world built on visible and invisible borders. 
borders and mobility restrictions have not stopped or reduced migration. Since the early 1980s, the number of migrants, according to United Nations Population Division, has more than doubled. Still, we are talking only about 3% of the whole population on the Earth. Likewise, the number of forced displaced people have increased uh, during the past two decades. This year, more people are forced displaced than at any point since 1994. What the borders achieve is not stopping mobility across borders, but making it more costly for migrants, both in terms of money and life. I was illegal migrant in the late 1980s. I crossed five states, five countries without papers. My study today among undocumented migrants shows differences between their journey experiences and mine. The smugglers they deal with differ drastically from those migration brokers I met on my journey. I reject calling um, them smugglers for not criminalizing them because they were not criminal. They saved my life from the police, from the authorities, from the law. Harsher border control has resulted in more sophisticated human smuggling operation. Current global human smuggling requires more information, transnational connections and expertise than before. Brokers I met before in the late 1980s have been driven out of the market by more professional actors with more organized and transnational networks. Migrants pay the price of a harsher of border control, harsher border control, not only with their money, but also with their lives. The brutality of human smuggling has increased with the tightening of the border control. Since the smuggling of people by air has become almost impossible, smugglers now use lands and sea routes. To circumvent the most controlled border sections, smuggling routes have been relocated to more inaccessible and dangerous areas. By closing the most accessible sections of borders, geography would do the rest, and it does. The border between poor world and rich world are turned into an exhibit of death. On average, 2.3 persons die daily along borders of Europe, and this number is based only on the documented cases. Borders impose a forced immobility on undesirable migrants, fixing them in camps, detention camps, transit camps, refugee camps. Temporary camps becomes permanent, refugee-ness becomes protracted, and documentedness becomes lifelong. In the utopian nation-state system, all human beings are supposed to belong to a nation. It is also mentioned in the utopian Declaration of Human Rights, Article 15. Everyone has the right to a nationality. But the declaration is silent on the obligation of the states to grant immigrants and stateless people such nationality. Outside the nation state system, there is no space for humanity. There is no space for something like the pure human being in herself beyond legal and political status. Statelessness is regarded as a temporary status, even though it may last for generations. The permanent status of statelessness, of being just a human being, is incompatible with the logic of the nation-state system. Those outside this order, the stateless, constitute leftover population. As Hannah Arendt said, only in the nation-state system, this universal form of organizing of humanity in terms of native citizenship could the lose of home and political status become identical with being expelled from humanity altogether. Borders are used by the states to expose migrants and even non-migrants to exclusion, discrimination, and exploitation. Borders legitimate the states 
to use its discriminatory power against refugees, travelers without papers, non-citizen migrants. Borders target even citizens who found themselves turned into quasi-citizens whose right can be suspended, rejected, delayed, and denied because of their religion, ethnicity, color of skin, or class. The Swedish Reva project this year is a good example of this. It was internal border control in Stockholm underground to arrest undocumented migrants. The racialized profile of so-called illegal migrant reminded many Swedes born in Sweden or Swedish citizens since long time ago that the state still does not recognize them as real Swedes. Borders violate not only human rights, but also citizen rights. Another example is the case of Romani people deported from Sweden because they were begging for money in the Stockholm underground. They were European Union citizens and had right to stay in Sweden for three months. The mobility of Roma people is different from mobility of other European Union citizens, like many of us in this room. Their mobility is not desirable because of their ethnicity and class. Their mobility is mobility of mob. As Papadopoulos et al. shows, the term mobility refers not only to movement, but also to the common people, the working class, the mob. The whole border issue is about foreigners, those who never stop to be a foreigner, no matter how long they have been in the country, no matter how integrated they are in the whole society. As Balibar, Etienne Balibar says, borders have, been, have become invisible borders, situated everywhere and nowhere. And desirable people are no are not expelled by borders. They are forced to be borders. The question is not anymore what or where is the border, but who is the border. Borders don't restrict mobility. They restrict rights. To say free mobility is Europe, utopian means that is not possible, that is impractical. We should remember that human beings moved freely for a long time before free mobility became stigmatized and criminalized. Free mobility is also carried out every day now by those who don't recognize or respect borders by travelers without papers. Irregular migration done by hundreds of thousands every year indicates the condition of possibility for free mobility. What is illusory is to believe that we can keep the current border regime and at the same time respect and follow human rights and citizen rights. What is misleading is the fact that instead of thinking about the possibilities of radical change, we extend dystopian situation for displaced people through so-called humanitarian interventions, a little more generous asylum policy, a little more money to UNHCR, building larger and better refugee camps. A no-border approach may sound an realistic idea. It is, however, an inspiring vision for a better future than the one that awaits us. What is unrealistic is the idea of a successful and effective border control. A look at our world, which every part of it is linked to other parts, of, parts through roads, cables, flight routes, media, economy, or personal connections, tell us that stopping mobility of those who are motivated to move is unrealistic. In 1987, in Karachi, when I was a person without paper, I told a Dalal, a migration broker, that it seems to be almost impossible to cross borders to Europe. 
And he looked at me and smiled and said, son, they cannot close the doors of the world. Thank you. Good morning. I have 15 minutes to convince you uh, to vote in favor of the motion because that's the only sensible position. So I will go straight ahead. <laughs> talking and I will be showing visuals. I, I only have 15 minutes so every uh, image that I show has actually a story and so I will let you uh, guess how it's related to what I'm saying or how it's unrelated. The ability to travel freely is spread unevenly within and across within countries and across the planet. Is global free movement then a utopian idea in order to voice an informed opinion and convince you of uh, going and voting before the motion, or I want to unpack the keywords of the motion and the assumptions they carry with them. Human movement involves much more than mere motion. It is, as I define it in my own work, a complex social cultural assemblage infused with meaning. People have come to imagine that movement, certainly of the long distance type, is border crossing, as though borders came first and movement second. And if we put this in a long durée perspective, uh, I would argue that we have seen over the last 500 years or more an increase of mobility control, both along international and internal borders. At the same time, border crossing travel seems to have become one of the most powerful socially stratifying factors leading to a global hierarchy of movements. Currently dominant mobility discourses link movement to three positively valued characteristics. One, the ability to move, also called motility, the ease of movement, and last, the tendency to change. This translates into three taken for granted assumptions, which have been influenced partly by neoliberal and free market ideologies. One, that there is increasing movement. Two, that movement is a self-evident phenomenon. And three, that movement generates change mostly of the positive type. Although the motivations to move may vary widely and are certainly not all voluntary, as we have heard before, movement is generally perceived as a marker of freedom. It is a widespread idea that much of what is experienced as freedom lies in mobility, the utopia of the 21st century. Ironically, restrictions on border crossing travel are more common now than ever before. Freedom of movement is often more limited for minors, for people charged with or convicted of crimes, for women and for members of disfavored racial and social groups. Also specific circumstances such as war or conflict affect the freedom of movement. Free movement implies that, border, that people can cross legal borders back and forth to live, work, study or retire elsewhere temporarily or permanently. Global freedom of movement refers to the right of people to circulate without restrictions across the surface of the world. By right is meant only that others have a duty not to interfere with people's attempts to cross borders. While this is of course wishful thinking on a global scale, 
There are regional examples. In Africa, the 15 countries of ECOWAS, the economic community of West African states, have free movement policies, policies since the 1970s. The European Union is probably the most advanced case of a regional entity committed to free circulation within its borders, with legal provisions extending well beyond the basic economic logic. Indeed, fostering the free movement of people has been a major goal of European integration since the 1950s. Arguments in favor of free movement pertain mostly to economic or political efficiency and to ethical considerations. From an economic perspective, freedom of movement would create a unified world labor market. The long-standing ethical argument is often traced back to Immanuel Kant's 1795 essay toward perpetual peace, in which he argues that states need to submit themselves to cosmopolitan laws, embracing all the peoples of the earth. This is based on the premise that the peoples of the earth, not rulers or states, own the planet and therefore must be free to travel anywhere on its surface. The link between movement, freedom and rights is well established, and we have heard it before. Article 13 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. And two, everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his country. Importantly, these rights are entirely framed by the organization of the world into sovereign states. There is no human right of free movement across state borders and no right to access or to settle in another country. Freedom as movement is composed both of opportunities to travel when and where one pleases and of the feasibility of the choice not to travel. And this is something that I want to stress because it is an essential aspect of freedom as mobility. Freedom of movement implies the right not to move. The, ideolo the ideological associations of movement with liberty, freedom, and universalism contain serious shortcomings and neglect the social costs. Indeed, free movement is far from free, not only in the sense of libre, but also in the sense of without costs. People's travel choices are pertinent to and normalized within the dominant ideologies and mobility regimes with which they engage. Modern forms of travel need not signify privilege. Recent research on the human costs of hypermobility among managers of multinationals, for instance, shows the importance of questioning the voluntary aspect and individual desirability of mobility. There is only a tiny global economic elite which financial capitalism has liberated from all spatial constraints and which therefore produces the only social group able to choose freely between mobility and immobility. Moving on to utopia. In the 16th century, the humanist Thomas More coined the term utopia for an ideal imaginary island nation. More's book inspired people to set up real intentional communities that attempted to create ideal societies. Interestingly, utopian, utopian imaginary communities provided one of the first spaces for working out the particular shapes and boundaries of nation states that we are critiquing the whole time. Utopian projects are characterized by impractical perfection. Nowadays, they have come to be reviled as illusory, dangerous, and against human nature. Sociologists Philippe Couton and José Julian López argue that from its, from its inception, movement has been central to the utopian tradition. In their words, and I quote, the power of utopianism indeed resides in its ability to instantiate the tension between movement and place that has marked social transformations in the modern era. This tension continues in contemporary discussions of movement-based social practices, particularly international migration and related identity formations such as open borders, transnationalism and cosmopolitanism." Unquote. The fundamental shift brought about by the Industrial Revolution was centered on the control of movement by displacing farmers to feed emerging industries, by controlling the movement of this emerging geographically mobile class within well-defined borders, and by encouraging the movement of traders and colonialists. And it's very interesting to, to compare that with what's going on in countries like China. 
Gypsies came to be regarded as the epitome of the greatest threat to population control, vagrancy. From the late 19th century onwards, a utopian figuration developed around the more enduring type of movement, migration, often overlapping with civilizing colonialism. Movement abated as the world seemed to settle into the bordered world of firmly in place nation states in the years following the First World War. So it's not all that old. The limitations of a system that presumed mutually exclusive citizenries became soon evident. In 1921, a conference of the International Parliamentary Union met in Stockholm to condemn the passport system and to call for more freedom of movement. Contemporary utopia, Couton and Lopez argue, has preserved the necessary movement that brings people to new shores, but has reversed the priority, and I quote them again, for many, the defining places of modernity turned out to be mostly restrictive cages of bureaucratized coercion. The opening of space qua space, roaming rather than joining to a new place, is the source of contemporary utopian imaginations, the process rather than the destination, unquote. Dominant utopias are now chiefly those of free movement and placeless space, replacing routes with routes. Contemporary utopias of itinerancy are conceived in terms of the idealization of universal frictionless movement. It is in this context that we have to situate discussions of how to regulate or, how, or deregulate global migration and the ongoing open borders debate and no borders activism. Since the end of the 1980s, border crossing movements have been the object of increasingly restrictive policies based not so much on perceived threats of mobility as such, but on the assumption that migration as permanent settlement in particular leads to threats to security and stability of receiving states. This has led to practices such as the detention and forced expulsion of illegal migrants, the increased militarization of borders, reduced access by migrants to welfare provisions such as health, health services and education, cooperation with undemocratic states of origin or transit to curb migration, and the conditionality of development aid upon migration cooperation. In this context, complete borderlessness is a hoped for universalization of liberalism. But it is also, and perhaps more importantly, an upgrading and rethinking of the site of political imagination from the national to the global, through utopia. Stated differently, much in the same way that utopian migratory itinerancy envisages the detachment of individuals from place through the erosion of national borders, it equally emphasizes a new type of post-national citizen equipped with a cosmopolitan subjectivity. The discourse on cosmopolitanism draws on many of these predicates, and it is a powerful contemporary figuration of itinerancy in the global world. It is not only an issue in transnational migration, but perhaps even more so in tourism, study abroad programs, and other forms of more temporary mobilities. And I want to remind you all that the motion is about free movement, not about free migration. The utopias imagined in new mobility discourses range from the dead of distance idea, the hypermobile society in which most people behave as if they are footloose and fancy free, to demands for deacceleration, uh, the so called slow movements, which we also have in academia. New modes of making oneself at home and a flourishing world society that is characterized by eco justice and equity with regard to climate emissions. Whether approaching the one extreme or the other, questions of inequality are sure to crop up. Mobility ideologies equate geographical movement with social fluidity, negating the fact that social cultural structures also contribute to travel behavior, that movements are subject to social constraint, and that opportunities to upward socioeconomic mobility, to which individuals seemingly respond by being physically mobile, are as much freely wanted and realized opportunities as choices by default, with the legal structures regulating who can and cannot move being crucial. There is an in inherent paradox in the idealization of freedom of movement. Freedom entails developing the infrastructure to defend the free movement and operations of some, and to strictly curtail the freedom of others. Ironically, restrictions on, movements, or on movement limit people's freedom to circulate thus leading, de facto, to a higher rate of permanent migration and discouraging seasonal workers, for instance, from returning, temporarily or not, to their country. Mexican migration to the United States 
illustrates these points. Mexicans keep trying to cross the militarized border until they succeed, and given the difficulty of doing so, tend to remain on a more permanent basis in the host country. Let us return to the celebrated example of the EU. European freedom of movement is a unique legal and political construction, one in which, uh, a construction in which one has the right to move, to travel, to live, to work, to study, and to retire in a world without frontiers. However, the EU combines this utopian discourse on borderless Europe as a new, larger insight with sophisticated mechanisms of discrimination. Inside, these also include transition periods for the citizens of the newly joining states of Central and Eastern Europe, who are not granted the full rights of mobility for an open-ended number of years. The elements of anti-utopia are numerous. At the outer borders of the EU, rigid boundaries are erected, and this is just an example of the Frontex system. Since the very beginning, each step of EU enlargement has been accompanied by fears of massive migration flows that turned out to be ungrounded. The migration factor is actually lower in the EU than in the world at large. In 1971, Roger Nett wrote that the right of free movement of people on the face of the earth was the civil right we are not ready for. This still seems to be the case today. Although the majority of the world's population stays put, there is a profound fear that as more people will have the ability to cross borders, they will actually do so. This rests, I argue, on a failure to distinguish between mobility and motility, the ability to move. A related misconception is the assumption that free movement unavoidably leads to more migration in the sense of permanent resettlement rather than more mobility, movements back and forth in the context of marriage, birth, study, work, leisure, religion, retirement, or even death. Scholarship is still too much focused on migration as the dominant form of border crossing movement. And I think we urgently need to start addressing the rise of more temporary types of mobility because they raise a whole different set of issues. The most important probably being the question of long-term sustainability in the environmental and sociocultural sense, and both globally and on more local levels. So would the world, uh, so, sorry, so would the free movement of people around the world be utopian? Yes, for multiple reasons, and not only in the negative sense of dystopia. A fundamental question to answer is whose utopia it is, and by which motivations it is driven. A whole set of values has developed around border crossing mobilities embodying and generating the necessary meanings and symbols that enforce and reproduce the boundaries between the collective and the individual, duty and freedom, the self and the imagined community, the material and the ideal. I think it is our task as engaged anthropologists to disentangle the social culturally inflected meanings, values and impacts of both global mobility and immobility. And if we do so, you will see that voting in four of the motion is the only option. Thank you. My name is Nicholas Di Genova. The fulcrum around which this debate pivots is the word utopian. As in the very first formulation of the idea of utopia by Thomas More in his work of social satire by the same title from 1516, the very notion of utopia playfully evokes simultaneously a good place, indeed the most perfect conceivable place, and no place, a place that does not exist and by implication could never exist. Thus the term is equivocal. It is suggestive at one and the same time of a good place that is genuinely conceivable, which is to say it's possible to conceive of it, and yet so elusive under current circumstances as to seem unfathomable. Another locus classicus of the term utopian 
and one that seems highly pertinent to the way in which the word has been deployed in the motion for this debate is the pamphlet, quite well known in some circles, by Friedrich Engels, Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific from 1880. In this polemical juxtaposition, the adjective utopian comes to signal everything that may be disparaged as not scientific. Thus, utopian becomes a virtual epithet with which to denounce and dismiss all that is fanciful, speculative, illusory, ungrounded, unrealistic, unscientific. After all, Engels understood his critical task to be, quote, to make a science of socialism, to ground it firmly upon a real basis. In his terse sketch of the historical context of the first socialist theories arising in the immediate aftermath of the French Revolution, and gaining currency in the first decades of the 19th century, Engels refers to social conditions that were, in effect, immature from the point of view of the emergence of independent political self-assertion by the new class of modern proletarians. To the extent that the historical prerequisites were lacking for the modern working class to resolve the contradictions of capitalist society in practice, Engels contended, so also for socialist theory. Engels, Engels explains, and I quote, to the crude conditions of capitalist production and the crude class conditions correspond crude theories. The, so, the solution of the social problems, which as yet lay hidden in undeveloped economic conditions, the, the, the utopians attempted to evolve out of the human brain. Society presented nothing but wrongs. To remove these was the task of reason. It was necessary then to discover a new and more perfect system of social order and to impose this upon society from without, by propaganda, and wherever it was possible, by example of model experiments. These new social systems were foredoomed as utopian. The more completely they were worked out in detail, the more they could not avoid drifting off into pure fantasies." End quote. Hence, the word utopian comes to be derisively equated with the fantastical, with wishful thinking and pipe dreams, with idealism, pure and simple. Nevertheless, Engels was as unreserved in his admiration as in his criticism. Even as he repudiated the utopians for their unfounded and ungrounded blueprints for socialism, he celebrated their anti-capitalist aspirations. We delight, remarked Engels, we delight in the stupendously grand thoughts and germs of thought that everywhere break out through their fantastic covering. Thus, even in its most flamboyantly polemical usage, where the term utopian is relegated to the status of a veritable curse word, there's also the acknowledgement of this equivocal sense of the utopian as something that may be insufficient, but which is, in fact, utterly and indisputably necessary. In this respect, we, with regard to the specific subject of the contention of this debate, if we are inclined to believe that the free movement of people around the world would be a good thing, that such a world of free mobility would be a truly good place, and in that sense would be a kind of utopia, then we could only accept to argue for the motion, because it should be utopian. Such a good place would be utopian by definition and must necessarily also be the no place toward which we project an emancipatory vision of that which does not exist, which does not yet exist. What Henri Lefebvre conceived as the possible impossible, through which we move in both thought and action toward a horizon of virtualities, realizing in both theory and practice the actual possibilities which are latent in our contemporary reality and thus which constitute that horizon. Although I might otherwise rise to the defense of this sort of utopian thought, however, I've been assigned the role of arguing against the motion. It is my task here today to insist that the free movement of people around the world would not be utopian. Thus, let me affirm in no uncertain terms that the human freedom of movement is not utopian. Indeed, it is one of the most elementary, objective, and scientific truths about the human condition. It is an already established, actually existing, verifiable, and indisputable fact. And everything that we've seen today verifies that. Here, <laughs> I begin from what we might call first principles. 
elementary and foundational starting points for thought. To be human is to be mobile. For us, to be alive is to move. We are not plants. <laughs> we are not plants rooted in a single place from which we grow and expand in more or less constrained or restricted ways. Our defining capacity as a species to creatively and purposefully transform our surroundings and productively and consciously modify our circumstances, our existential vocation for labor, if you will, is inseparable from our freedom our fundamental freedom of movement. This likewise means that our inherently social character as a species is also contingent upon our mobility. Hence, the freedom of movement of the human species is an absolutely basic and non-negotiable non aspect of the most general mode of life. This is not merely a philosophical predilection or a theoretical conceit, much less a dogmatic political position. It is an indisputable and immutable objective fact. To be human and alive under any semblance of natural or normal or healthy circumstances is to be mobile. Furthermore, this freedom of movement that we naturally and ordinarily take as a presupposition comes to be constrained or delimited only through the interference of obstacles and barriers of various sorts. Such obstructions may be natural ecological or geological features of a particular environment in which instance our freedom of movement has almost always, eventually, but inexorably, circumvented and surpassed them. We are, after all, a species that has even transgressed the limits of our own planetary and atmospheric habitat and ventured to explore the surface of the moon. Hence, our freedom of movement as a species has ultimately manifested itself as a freedom to move around the entire globe and beyond. The freedom of movement to people around the world, therefore, would not be utopian. It is already a proven fact. More important, however, for our purposes here today, the obstacles and barriers to our free mobility may be artificial ones, erected through the more or less calculated machinations of social and political forces. In other words, various historically specific configurations of our own social life and the deployment of our political, juridical, and military capabilities toward the ends of sustaining separations, boundaries, and borders between distinct categories of humans have paradoxically been the source of the most decisive and consequential constrictions of our freedom of movement as a species. Thus, our existential freedom of movement as a species has been actively suppressed or restricted, distorted or perverted, and made to appear more and more utopian by the active interference and deliberate interventions of our own misguided, self-defeating, and counterproductive politics. We may therefore affirm that the free movement of people around the world is not utopian. Rather, what is utopian is the absurd fantasy of territorially defined so-called national states. The, the fantasy of total control the fantasy of total control over presumably separate and discrete human populations and our mobility, the perverse fantasy of border policing. What is utopian is the statist delusion of border policing ensuring a comprehensive control over geopolitical space. Our freedom, however, is not utopian at all. We move now from first principles to the objective facts verified by history and ethnography. Some may object at this point that it is I who am blowing utopian pipe dreams, stupendously grand thoughts, to recall Engel's phrase, of a human freedom of movement that has been almost everywhere subservient, if not utterly subjugated, a free mobility that has been abundantly shown to be subordinated, if not outright defeated. The objective fact is that we now live in a world that more than ever before resembles what Hannah Arendt memorably called a barbed wire labyrinth. The human freedom of movement is beleaguered, if not besieged, as never before. This, indeed, is true. We have the evidence of history as well as the evidence of contemporary ethnographic research to corroborate this pitiful state of affairs. But, we, but may we reasonably take this deplorable condition to mean that the freedom of movement of people around the world would be utopian? Let us proceed scientifically, judiciously, and carefully. Let us not jump to undue conclusions. The first fallacy 
is to see only what is most obvious, only what is flagrant and flamboyant, only that which makes an ostentatious spectacle of itself and commands our attention. The first fallacy is to perceive only the political, juridical, and military enactments of state projects upon territory, which so commonly manifest themselves as the patrol and enforcement of relatively exclusionary borders. As I've long argued, these sorts of border spectacle make a robust and grandiose display of their technologies and techniques of ostensible exclusion, above all directed against the most humble of human border crossers but they also conceal something. Border patrols and the diverse efforts of state powers at border control have everywhere arisen as reaction formations. They are responses to a prior fact, the mass mobility of human beings on the move, the autonomy of migration, the manifest expression of the freedom of movement of the human species, even to designate this mobility as quote unquote migration is already to collude in the naturalization of the borders that serve to produce the difference between a state's putative inside and outside, and thus which construct the very profoundly consequential difference between the presumably proper subjects of a state's authority and those mobile human beings branded as aliens, foreigners, migrants. After all, if there were no borders, there would be no migrants, only mobility. But there is one objective truth that must not be lost in the shuffle. The free movement of people around the world and hence across these border zones came first. The multifarious attempts to manage or control this free mobility have come always as a reaction. The maintenance and enforcement of borders we may therefore affirm is a reactionary utopianism indeed. A second fallacy. A second fallacy is to believe that these efforts at border control are purely exclusionary. As a matter of scientific fact, much of what these border controls actually do is a work of filtering human mobility, sorting and ranking the free movement of people around the world into a differentiated hierarchy of more or less permissible and more or less prohibited varieties of mobility. Thus, the spectacles of border policing and immigration enforcement present themselves as essentially exclusionary, but conceal what is frequently a massive process of inclusion, albeit a kind of inclusion that seeks to subordinate our human freedom of movement into sufficiently docile and tractable categories of purportedly desirable or undesirable, <laughs> deserving or undeserving, welcome or unwanted human mobility. In this way, the border and immigration regimes that have proliferated largely only over the last century or so, and often much more recently than that, these border regimes are less about precluding or eliminating the freedom of movement and rather more about facilitating it according to various formula of control and management. Thus we may note that the free movement of people around the world far from a utopian fantasy is in fact one of the central and defining dynamics that constitutes our contemporary global condition. Yet another fallacy about the border spectacle. While increasingly militarized and securitized borders around the world conceal various state projects for the selective importation of migrants in spite of their ostensible premier task of exclusion, they also conceal the fact that even those migratory movements which are officially prohibited and supposed to be absolutely rejected are in fact, objectively speaking, actively encouraged and enthusiastically facilitated. So-called illegal and officially unauthorized migrations are, to various extents, actively and deliberately imported and welcomed by prospective employers as a highly prized variety of labor power. In other words, the border spectacle and its grand performance of exclusion is accompanied almost everywhere by the objective fact of illegalized human mobility on an ever-expanding scale. Again, this mass mobilization of cross-border migrants is deeply inflected by its own intrinsic and heterogeneous forms of autonomy. Again, we witness that the free movement of people around the world is already an actually existing scientific fact, an objective truth. The allegedly utopian no place of a world of human mobility is the world in which we live.
Now, there's no question that this sort of freedom of movement, the autonomy of illegalized migrant mobility, is hardly the utopia of a perfect world. But freedom is not given, it is taken. Freedom is not a right stipulated by state powers on dry parchment and allocated fastidiously by bureaucrats or border policemen. The indisputable objective fact of the free movement of people around the world that is everywhere in evidence and verified by social science on an ever more mass scale confronts a truly horrifying panoply of material and practical impediments and obstructions. But in spite of it all, everywhere on a global scale, human beings continue to prevail in their mobility projects, unceasingly and tirelessly establishing migration as a central and constitutive fact of our global presence. And our freedom of movement as a species asserts itself anew, staking a claim to the space of the planet as a whole. The proliferation of ever more obstreperous borders, therefore, only confirms for us the birth pangs of the agonistic arrival of a world without borders. Utopianism, some may pronounce, incredulously or contemptuously, bewildered or aghast at the fearless audacity of a truly critical social science. But there's nothing utopian about what I've depicted for you. It is the objective truth of the world in which we live. As Marx and Engels memorably asserted with regard to their own theoretical conclusions, my contentions here today merely express, in general terms, actual relations springing from an existing struggle, from an historical movement going on under our very eyes. It is the task of a genuinely critical social science to theorize these struggles, to analyze the objective truth of these agonistic and antagonistic dynamics that constitute the decisive and defining contradictions of our planetary present. In the spirit of the theme of this conference, evolving humanity, emerging worlds. Our science must risk such accusations of utopianism in order that we may better comprehend how to act in the world to effectively usher in a radically different global sociopolitical way of life that would be adequate to our freedom of movement by reconsolidating and securing a new relationship between the human species and the space of the planet. Please allow me, therefore, to declare once more the freedom of movement of people around the world would not be utopian. It would be simply an intensification and enrichment of our actually existing freedom. It would be simply one key facet of reaffirming and reconstituting the freedom that is our birthright. The free movement of people around the world would not be utopian. It would be an elementary expression of our creative capacity and productive power as a species. Thank you. Thank, thank you for four fantastic contributions to this debate. Um, we, uh, as we started a little late and wish to end on time, we uh, have only about 15 to 20 minutes from further contributions from the floor, and we have two roving microphones okay. uh, for you to contribute. As we have such a short time, I would urge you to be as brief as you can in your contribution, and then we will follow it with uh, four very short presentations from our speakers before we uh, vote on the motion. Roving mics? Yeah. One, two, three. Can I go ahead? Yes, please, yeah. please do. Uh, Claire Oxby, um, I, I, want to, I, I want to draw to ten attention to something that happened to me in this conference. I went to a panel, and I found that the convener was there, but there were no participants. And I was told that none of the participants, many came from India, were able to get their visa in time. And the only reason why the, the panel uh, discussant was able to get their visa was because uh, he'd done a plea for special priority consideration because he was a convener. 
So I would just like to draw attention, I think this is becoming an increasingly common problem with uh, university debates, especially in this country. I think there have been other examples of conferences being held up by this kind of uh, discussion. Um, and I would just like to conclude very briefly that this it shouldn't be utopian uh, for people, it shouldn't be considered um, an unreachable ideal for people to be invited to a conference, pay up, book their tickets, and then at the last minute not be able to come because of the authorities here that can't um, uh, negotiate, or oh, maybe is the, I don't know if the academic, the people who organize this conference have tried to facilitate this, I don't know, but this was the Very result. Much. An empty uh, panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is this working? Yeah. I mean, the short answer to that is yes, but I'll talk about that in the General Assembly. Um, I, I want to suggest a wonderful contribution. It's been a wonderful debate, and I'd like to congratulate everybody for, for, for what they've said. I want to introduce the idea that not moving might be the utopia. And let me try and illustrate it in, in 10 seconds with the kind of stuff I work on, on people who move from the south of Latin America eventually to the United States. Um, until recently, if you moved from Central America across the Mexican border, you stood quite a high chance of being kidnapped by uh, a criminal group working in conjunction with federal migration officials. And if your family didn't send on the money they'd been holding for your border crossing in the United States, you would probably be killed and thrown into a mass grave. However, more recently, the bad guys, as people refer to them, have realized that enslaving people is vastly more profitable. Okay, so you think, really, really bad, but obviously hugely profitable. And on the other hand, we have the state. Bad guys, criminals, extort. But what does the state do? What is the American border like? Hugely profitable construction companies profiting from building ridiculous walls private prison corporations profiting from building detention centers. And our own lovely government here profiting ever more, rising visa charges, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got two things that are mirroring each other. And really the only way to stop this parasitic feeding by a state and other kinds of actors who are increasingly indistinguishable from each other in, in various senses is for people not to move and to try and deal with the, the unfreedom that is, in most cases, driving them away from where they live. Thank you. Can I ask um, future speakers, uh, if for the sake of the recording, to say their name before they speak? Thank you. I'm Gracia Clark from Indiana University. I like the idea of freedom not being given but taken, and I think we should remember from your long, um, from the long, uh, time depth of that speaker's presentation that also the borders themselves were not uh, given but taken. That is, they were established by humans relatively recently and therefore can be dismantled. I think that's the point of, of Engels for one thing. But also borders themselves become movable in the sense of free trade zones and other areas that are exempted from locality. So, so one shouldn't think of the freedom of movement of capital as something that's taken for granted, but that has been constructed through state intervention uh, as well, and has its own sort of utopic, or you might say dystopic um, aspects. Thank you. Hi, uh, Tim Ingold. I, I, I would like to speak up for plants. Um, uh, the last speaker just said that we are not plants, we move. Um, uh, but plants move too. Uh, they move uh, quite simply because they grow. And the only reason why we think plants don't move is because we, we assume that movement comprises the displacement of an already completed entity from one point to another. Plants don't do that. But the roots of plants grow through the soil and find their way through. 
And that growth is the being of the plant. And I would suggest that, that, that we too should think of human movement not as the displacement of human beings as individual entities from one point to another, but as movements in themselves, as ways of growth. And limiting movement is limiting growth and limiting life. Thank you. Uh, in the context of, uh, I'm Amlan Ray from Calcutta, India. In the context of the freedom which is talked about, this is taken, is not, is not given. Uh, I'd like to uh, put an impression on the freedom has to be achieved. In the context of subjective movement, contextual movement, and objective movement. And what is your, the status of the movement when you are neonates? Your movement areas is the only the lap of your mother. When you start working, the toddler, you have the movement in and around the room. When you become adolescents, your movement is around the neighbor. And when you become mid-career person, now you have starting, be trying, accumulating your power of wisdom, where to move, where not to move. So biologically, there is a correct disciplines and guidelines to take care of yourself in the movement questions. So if you say the world passport and all these things is the utopian, definitely is the utopian. And if you say on the other hand, you have the movement, some, some conditionalities, for example, Sinjan visa. If we take a Sinjan visa from India, we can go around and around the Europe, but except UK. And UK call themselves, they are not European. And if I get into the chance of being UK visa, which is a very, very, I mean, hell of a job to get a visa, we cannot go out from England. So again, is the conditionalities. So if we say the utopian, I don't believe in utopian, but if you say you can have a free movement to, to other part of the world, it is not also correct. And the questions of the, uh, in, in, in agreement with the team in gold, if you see the dissertations and the lectures of the Sir Richard Attenborough in the private life of plants, they are also moving. They are also talking. They also put themselves as a protections. Curse the pollen migrations. So don't say the plants are not like the human beings. We are all living beings. So I will favor the movements with the conditionalities. Thank you. I think free movement is utopian. When we think, I think about my relative freedom of movement, but not, you know, even if the political impediments were removed, what about the financial impediments? So free movement is utopian unless everybody has equal access to the financial ability to move. And when, you know, this, when is this going to happen? Yeah, maybe it would be nice, but it's utopian. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chris Simonetti from Aberdeen. Um, I, 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 can, uh, I feel that this cash in the debate has been very much about the reality of movement, and I was thinking of uh, our capacity for imagining movement or living in, or moving uh, in the realm of imagination. I was thinking of Kant, who formulated this uh, um, very well known uh, theory of uh, cosmopolitanism, um, but he never traveled much. Uh, but he knew the world very, very well. Dr. Skalnik, uh, I would like to uh, suggest uh, that we also take into account freedom of ideas. They also have to move, and uh, their movement is sometimes uh, restricted also by financial, uh, for example, costs of uh, journals, etc., etc. So at least I would like to ask Nicholas to give his uh, text uh, uh, freely uh, at the disposal of all of us. Thank you. Well, I'm Gustavo Lins Ribeiro from the University of Brasilia. I know that utopia is one of these uh, huge notions subject to a lot of uh, definitions and contentions. But I particularly like the definition of French philosopher Paul Ricoeur, 
Uh, he says that uh, utopia is the struggle in the present about the meaning of the future. It's, it's not a known place, it's not something that will never exist. If it is a, a, a struggle in the present for the, about the definition of the future, it's, it is immediately always political. Uh, Anna Zadrozna from Yeditepe University. Uh, I really like the idea uh, of borders which are filtering mobility. And uh, I see here, I would like to make here the point that uh, when we talk about the freedom of movement, it sounds so idealistic, but uh, there is also factual ability to move. And uh, what the borders factually are doing, they are also, they are of course filtering the people and their restrictions uh, who can or cannot move, they come from the inequality. And this inequality is, of course, visible in the hierarchy of the states, but also within the states. Uh, some people are more free and more equal than the others, and this is the fact. And uh, I mean, the, the debate uh, in some points is moving to the, the discussion around the, some terms. And uh, I mean, the, fact, the factual ability to move comes strictly from economic and um, economic yeah, yeah, reasons, but also from, um, from like here was the point to the, uh, that the ideas should also move. And uh, actually, if we take a look how the ideas and thoughts are moving around the world, it also displays the hierarchy of the states. I mean, some ideas and thoughts are more free and more equal to move. Thank you. Hi, um, Charlotte Joy Goldsmiths. Um, I was wondering whether the, the utopian part wasn't the movement, but was a destination. And if the utopian part is having freedom in the destination, is it more about private property and share? I mean, I, 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 I agree with you that movement is a reality, but what happens when you get to this utopian place? And maybe that's the, the, the debate. I'm Judith Oakley. There's been mention of Roma and gypsies crossing borders. I want to draw attention to the state of English gypsies in this country now, thanks to the coalition government. The majority of gypsies and travelers, their descendants with whom I lived, are now forcibly in houses, and they call it being trapped in, tri in bricks and mortar. They are not allowed movement. And yet it would be cheaper for them to be allowed to have caravans and chalets. But now they are on sink estates, suffering from deeper depression. So internal movement within this country for nomads who've been here for centuries is now virtually forbidden. Um, Patty Gray from Maynooth, and I want to strongly support the argument um, against the motion, and I, and I like this idea that you're making about um, state borders being about inclusion and that the state borders themselves are what's um, utopian. Um, and, and my story is, is that I'm a US citizen, I'm a migrant. I, I migrated from the United States to Ireland and I see this every time I cross the border and I do it all the time, that I am very specifically being included in the utopian state of Ireland. Um, it's easy for me to cross the border and I, and I I constantly watch those who are being utopianly sort of excluded um, from, from that project. So I think you were spot on with that observation. Thank you. We, we have just time for one or, or perhaps two more uh, contributions. Hello, I'm uh, Bob Akhirazwani. Uh, I'm chairman of uh, Association for the Study of Ethnogeopolitics and also from University of Amsterdam. Uh, I do not want to discuss about uh, whether uh, the freedom of movement is uh, utopian or not. Humans uh, do whatever they want. Uh, it's as uh, utopian as humans uh, make of it. But uh, one or two uh, um, remarks about the gentleman said that uh, uh, nation states uh, are utopian. Well, um, you know, this uh, uh, 
the, 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 the artificiality of uh, nation states. Uh, this idea has to do with Eurocentric uh, way of thought. Nation states, or rather uh, states, territorial states, has been there in all history. Some uh, researchers uh, may say that human beings, like uh, any other uh, living animals, are uh, territorial, uh, territorial uh, beings. I do not know uh, the truth about that, but the thing is that territorial states has been in history all the way. And it does not mean that uh, the freedom should be impeded by the territorial states or not. And uh, one thing, the people who are talking about a globalized world without the borders and things, uh, this idea has to do with uh, neoliberal uh, way of thinking. It has to do with the ascendancy and supremacy of capitalist uh, uh, world uh, without borders. And it, it only benefits uh, the huge multinationals. And so I think we should also think about this way. Thank you. OK, and I may also sound uh, rather reactionary here. Um, but, um, but Simone did say that um, the point was not to produce consensus. And it seems there is a strong consensus here that all migration control or, or filtering is bad. And I just wondered whether really all the speakers um, do take that position and indeed um, all the audience and are prepared to live with um, all the consequences that a position like that might bring. Okay, one final, one final person at the back. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you. My name is Rose Boswell. I'm from South Africa. Um, but I've lived in many different places and what, what is interesting for me in this discussion is this presumption that um, you know that freedom of movement should be open to everyone and the fact that there are some people who having lived in South Africa there's some people who just pretty much stay put they have no desire to move and perhaps we should be encouraging these people to move in order to see the world it's one of the points that I've been trying to make for a little for quite a while the other side of it is having lived in Mauritius for a number of years there's some people who should just basically not be encouraged to travel um, in the sense that, you know, a um, country of 1.2 million people will receive about 1.5 million tourists a year. And the impact of that in the environment is devastating. So I think we should, although I'm very much in favor of the freedom of movement, considering what I've paid to basically come here, um, I'm also a little bit worried about the the freedom of people to move um, on the basis of financial uh, capacity. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to invite each of the speakers now in the same order to give us a very short summary. If you can possibly keep under five minutes, that would be even better. Um, Bella, would you like to start? Well, I think that was a very stimulating discussion, and we are not so disagreeing so much. <laughs> but I would like to say that uh, I tried to show what happens here, that according to the angle think, taken, we can agree or disagree with emotion. And we, are, we wouldn't be wrong or right. But I think, I think that I suggest strongly that why human mobility is millenary, the movement of people around the world, or, the, or either migration or just tourism, but, uh, has been emerged in, uh, since the 15th century with capitalist expansion, with imperialism, with structures of domination and social inequality, with racialization. So, and at the same time that there is this history of uh, domination and control over people, there is a simultaneously a history where the people that are trying to move or to stay, in, in mobi they are trying to stay, they don't want to leave or they want to leave. There is the agency, the, there is the human agency. And I am placing, and this is why I think that's important to look at the dreams, hopes, and projects of these people. And this is the basis of the struggle also 
between the structures and the people that are trying to move or they're going to stay. To, to stay. And this is what is, makes the claim that we have to look, like in terms of this inequality, in terms of the capital expansion, we have uh, to look for social justice and human rights. And in this sense, it's very important to look at the utopia or the utopian visions that are ingrained in the social movements. And we have really to empower the social movements. And if the claim now is for the rights to move, we have to, uh, to, to, to give strength to this right to move in terms of the borders. But it's more than this. It's access to resources. And also we have to have in mind that the hopes and the desires and the projects of the people themselves. Like, and what I am, and my position here in this panel is based on field work and, and experiences of people, either refugees from Congo, that for them, the project is just to have a house, just to have a job. And this is utopia, in this sense that I'm using utopia. As I'm using, Utopia in the sense, I think that he cares way, you know, but in the sense that, for instance, uh, research that we, my students have done on political exiles, either Portuguese political exiles that fought against Salazarism, or Brazilians that went to, for instance, that were in exile and went to Mozambique, what for? To make a revolution in Mozambique, the revolution, or to build a socialist a nation that they couldn't build in Brazil. And then this, uh, this is the drive, and this, there is some utopia or utopian vision that is driving this movement. And it, this, in this way that I am putting this position about utopia. Free not free movement as utopia, but at least the utopia that's ingrained in this uh, motion. Thank you very much. Um, listening to reflections from the floor, I, I say, uh, as I said in my presentation, of course, free mobility is not free. Uh, uh, Roma people, the case is is, uh, is an example, um, and this is why I didn't say a political vision for open borders but a political vision for no borders, that my argument is against the nation state system. And we, uh, when we say we are not ready for free movement, my question is, who are we? Who are we who says we are not ready for free movement? Tell this to those who are in detention centers. Tell this to those who are in shaky boats in the Mediterranean Sea right now. Um, what something is good with Ethiopian discussion is we can look at the, the present and look at history and historicize migration and mobility. If you look at, if you look back in history and 50, 60 years ago would say, to Western Europeans that a day will come that there will be no borders between France and Germany just after the Second World War. People would laugh to me. Go back only 25 years and say that there will be no border between East Europe and West, Western Europe, Western European country, and they would not believe you either. But this is reality today. So why are we so scared and uh, skeptical when we say there will be no borders and free movement will be a reality in future? I'm not talking again for open borders. I'm talking for no borders. It's not about cosmopolitanism. 
to feel yourself at home everywhere. My argument is to reject the notion of home, to argue for homelessness, not recognizing homelands, because the notion of home is exclusionary. When we include people in our home, at the same time we exclude others. Of course, we should take about, think about inequalities, class, uh, um, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and all these will be included in the idea of no borders thinking, not open borders, no, no borders thinking, uh, which puts in question the nation state system and the capitalist mode of production. Thank you. I would like to thank the floor for uh, some very interesting input and of course like all the debates we're dealing with very complex issues and anthropologists have this uh, urge always to stress how complex it is but we are here to debate and to vote on a motion and so we have to take sides uh, and I'm here to defend one side and the art of rhetorics is such uh, good orators are able to distract the audience from what we are really talking about and what we should be talking about. And I want to remind you of, of the motion, the actual motion, and every single word of that motion is actually important. And we should not change the words of the motion. So the motion is the free movement of people around the world would be utopian. So the verb is very important. It's, it's not is utopian, would be utopian. It's not the freedom of movement, it's about the free movement, and that's a very important uh, difference, and I don't have time in two minutes to explain what the difference is between free and freedom, but we are here to vote about the motion. And I want to stress some of, some of the arguments that I made. Uh, free movement, free as, as a concept contains uh, different meanings, and so we have been talking a lot about free as linked to freedom, but it's also free as in terms of no cost. Uh, I've, I'm actually very <laughs> surprised. I'm very surprised that, that no one has actually been thinking as a utopian. What if, what if uh, there would be no borders? And what if travel would be so cheap and people would all have the means to travel? What a disaster that would be. I mean, can you imagine the environmental consequences? And can you imagine the social consequences? Uh, this, is, and this is what some people have been arguing. Uh, so we should consider these different parts of the debate and we should definitely de-link and, and I have seen this constantly in the arguments. We're talking here about movement. We're not talking about migration. We're not talking about going elsewhere and building up a life elsewhere. We're talking about movement. And movement means that things are, are going around. People are going around. So it's, it's, uh, it's not necessarily just from A to B. It's from A to B and then back to A or from A to B to C. And so there are many different patterns and this is what we should be talking about. Talking about migration and envisioning building up a life elsewhere, that's only one of the many possible options. And uh, every people and around the world have actually the freedom to imagine. I mean, we've been talking about imaginers, to imagine a life elsewhere, but also a better life at home. And so I've been stressing a lot that when we are talking about this, uh, mobility and movement is not per se good or is not per se what we should all be aiming for and, and what we should all be uh, defending. Uh, we should equally be defending the right not to move and that's equally important and I think that should be definitely considered when we are thinking and uh, make a final decision and vote. And I think I've said. My opponents in this debate presented two pieces of evidence that I'd like to marshal in favor of my position <laughs> against. Um, someone in the audience said that it was a neoliberal point of view to celebrate the idea of a world without borders. Um, this is false. Neoliberalism is a strategy of capitalism. Noel Salazar presented 
a piece of visual evidence, an advertisement by Rabobank that said, some see countries with borders, we see markets with opportunities. I don't think the neoliberal credentials of that bank or any other can be questioned. <laughs> neoliberalism does not envision a world without borders because neoliberal neoliberalism is a strategy of capitalism and capitalism requires borders because borders produce differences in space, borders produce inequalities, and capitalism capitalizes on those inequalities. Capitalism exploits those inequalities. The second piece of evidence was the very, um, the very enduring song lyrics presented by Bella. Um, there were two lines that I wanted to call our attention to. The song said, stupidity divided us into flags. That's exactly right. Utopian stupidity. A utopian stupidity that ultimately culminates in the ultimate reactionary utopianism, fascism. But there was another line in the song, love without passports. A phrase in the song, love without passports. Love without passports is not utopianism. It is love. Similarly, freedom of movement without passports is not utopianism. It is freedom. Thank you. Thank you again. And now we come to the moment where you will have to make a decision. You have three choices. You may vote for the motion. The free movement of people around the world would be utopian. You may vote against the motion, or you may abstain. This is a... This is, a, this is a fundamental right of uh, democracy. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you uh, would like to support the motion, to vote for the motion, please raise a hand and hold it high in the air until I ask you to put it down again. Thank you. For the motion. If you would like to vote for the motion, Please raise your hand now and hold it in the air until we finish counting you. Thank you. If you would like to vote against the motion, oh, hang on a minute, sorry, those of you we haven't counted. Please, if you're voting for the motion, could you raise your hand again? Thank you. If you'd like to vote against the motion, please raise your hand now. Against the motion. Any abstentions?
The motion has been defeated by two to one. Thank you very much for your participation. And we have, before you go, please, before you go, we have an announcement. Before you go, just, just hang on five minutes. Uh, since I, I suspect a lot of people will not come to the General Assembly tonight, let me just address the question of British visa systems and all this kind of thing as the organiser of the Congress. Um, in this country, there is no political opposition to the current immigration policy, so it's not just a question of the government, it's a question of all political parties. That's not true. Oh, okay. Okay, the green, the, the green Party, I'm sorry, I meant the major, you know, the, the ones who are going to become the government. Sorry. Anyway, uh, so from the start, I mean, from the beginning of this year, we urged everybody to apply for visas early. We gave them all the official information they need. We put it on the website. We put it on the blog. We emailed them. Now, people who did apply early, and there were a number of people who refused visas, I attempted to get their decisions appealed by, on the one hand, drawing on my local MP and his team, and on the other hand, mobilizing the British Academy. Now, what you must understand is that students and academic visitors count in this country towards net immigration figures and the target of government policy is to massage net immigration figures. Almost all immigrants coming to England are actually from the EU. Um, okay, so the whole thing is farcical. It's been condemned by the British Academy on repeated occasions. But the, the political balance of forces, with apologies, <laughs> is, 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 is not in favour of changing the situation. So we advise everybody to, appeal early, to apply early because if you apply early, then there is some chance of successfully appealing. No, I know, I, I know, I'm going to say that next. Now, I am aware that some people get funding decisions very late and are incapable of complying, therefore, with the guidelines. I, this is terrible. But, I mean, that a lot of people from India did apply early and we did get some decisions overturned. And it's extremely hard to get an immigration refusal overturned. We didn't succeed in all of them, but we did succeed in in some, and I can tell you an awful lot, an awful lot of work went in by me, by the British Academy, and by the MP staff into trying to deal with these problems. I unambiguously condemn, as I've done on many other occasions, British immigration policy. I shall be writing a report for the International um, Council for Science on the way in which British immigration policy has affected this Congress and other recent congresses in terms of reducing the number of delegates and impeding academic exchanges. It is absurd that students and academic visitors are included in this political fraud of massaging net immigration figures. I condemn it unequivocally, and we have done our best within this situation to, to do what we can to help people. I mean, I assure you, an awful lot of time has been put in by an awful lot of people to deal with these problems. Um, that's really all I can say. I mean, we did take it seriously. We, from the moment we got the first refusal, we started trying to get these decisions reversed, and the fact that we did get some reversed was something an achievement, I think. Peter. Because it is connected with the status of anthropology, probably. That no, no, it's nothing to do with anthropology. I'll Look, understand. I'll tell you what the stop refusals are. You don't earn enough to come. The United States does this with conferences as well. It's not just the British. Um, you are, I am not convinced on the balance of probabilities that you don't intend to abandon your job and your family. They've refused visas to the non-EU-born spouses of EU citizens who have permanent residence rights in countries like Germany and Holland. This is a fraud, it's outrageous, it's obscene, and it's irrational. Okay, I have no doubt that these, these decisions are wrong. Um, 
and, and we contested them very vigorously. I mean, we attempted to parry, and the British Academy does this all the time. I mean, it's not just this Congress, but I mean, they've, they've done the same to natural scientists. I mean, I think what's going to happen is that ICSU is going to recommend to all its member organizations that the United Kingdom be boycotted for a major international event. But, you know, I mean, a lot of people have enjoyed this con Congress. Of course, lots of national, and the system is so discriminatory because many nationalities do not require visas. It's not actually as bad as the United States. There are lots of Mexicans here. There's lots of Argentinians here. There's lots of Brazilians here because they don't need visas unless they come as longer term academic visitor. I mean, I'm married to a Brazilian. Um, if you come as a longer term visitor, even if you're legally married to a British citizen, you no longer have any access to the National Health Service system. So, I mean, European migrants, uh, which was mentioned earlier. I mean, there's a slow, first of all, there's a phasing of people's rights. Now there's a reduction. Oh, well, sorry. You know, you come here and you'll have to lurk around for a few years working away without any access to the social services enjoyed by other legal residents of this country. I mean, I'm a legal resident of Brazil. I'm over 60, so I get free vaccinations against the flu and all that kind of thing. I mean, people are going to be here working and paying taxes who will not get, they're going to be second class citizens, as most of the Mexicans I've studied over the years are in the United States. I mean, a lot's been said about that in this debate. It is truly disgusting, and the only thing you could do about it is try and persuade your political representatives that if we go on like this, it will be not simply economically damaging to the UK, though it's certainly that, uh, but you know, it will destroy our ability in this country to be a major international academic force. I mean, I'm going to emigrate from this country when I retire this year. So. <laughs> my, my feet are where my mouth is. <laughs>